Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Lena, and I'm Lena Kejriwal, the founder of the Missing Link Trust. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody here today. Today is the 25th of November, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And with this day begins the UN 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. In solidarity with the campaign, Missing Link Trust is hosting this dialogue with a very special person and ally for women and survivors across the world, we. The campaign will continue on our social media platforms till the December 10th, and we invite you to join us, raise your voice, and together we will amplify the voices of women and gender minorities across the world. Do use the hashtags, how many more, and save missing girls. We know it needs no introduction. I would like to believe that. She is the author of critically acclaimed vagina monologues, which has been adapted in over 140 countries. She's a playwright and an author and an activist and a leader of unparalleled global uh, of an unparalleled global campaign to stop violence against women. I first met V on her visit to Calcutta. I don't know V if you do remember. But we were in a flash mob and we were dancing in Sonagachi. I think I can spot us both there. I mean, it was such an amazing day. It was awe inspiring, powerful moment when the girls and all of us took to the streets and we broke out into this supercharged dance, Jai Ho. And I mean, I mean, I mean, none of us could resist dancing. I remember you joined in, I joined in, we all joined in. And your presence there really inspired and mobilized people to break free. A little bit about the missing campaign. So why is it that me, Lena Kejriwal, is talking to me today? What's the context? So Missing Link Trust is an award-winning organization that uses the power of innovation, education, and empowerment to prevent sex trafficking. We strongly believe that awareness equals to prevention, and we use innovative tools and methodologies for mass engagement. Our vision is to create a world where every girl is safe from sex trafficking. Our work on prevention of trafficking takes a three-degree approach with our National School Awareness Program, which deals with a systematic awareness through innovative methods, leading to a systematic prevention of exploitation and trafficking on the other end. On the other end, we are working in the Sundarbans, which is the hotbed of trafficking and accounts for 44% of reported cases of trafficking in India. There, we provide alternative livelihoods and lead the ladies and the women to financial independence and uh, empowerment. As an artist, when I entered into this space, I always asked myself, what could I do which would really lend a new voice? What could I add to the space? And I realized like all my friends who were working in this space were actually working within the walls of the NGOs or the red light districts. And there was always a call for saying that there is a the population, the public, which is the main perpetrators of the crime, are totally going scot-free from any conversations. And that led me to create a public artwork. And the public artwork was titled Missing. It's the silhouette of a young girl. And I set it against the sky like black holes into which millions of girls disappear from the face of the earth. That's the visual metaphor which I created. And it's always since then been proven to be a very strong uh, starting point for most of our dialogues on anti-trafficking. So over four years now, and since we founded the trust, and our work is now under three pillars of education, innovation, and empowerment. We educate to create a new social fabric and to end demand by developing a systematic awareness program for school students. We also use innovative mediums like gaming, murals, chatbots, public artworks, interactive digital comics, immersive experiences, learning experiences on sex trafficking, which can create a very lasting impression on the on, on whoever's uh, uh, um, connecting with it. In the Sundarbans, we have our women empowerment centers where we provide livelihood skills to vulnerable women and empower them, like I was telling you. So the majority of the women that we have supported have reported a positive change in their family dynamics. And the center also acts like a sp safe space for women to discuss their uh, domestic problems against domestic violence, alcohol abuse, child marriage, rape, trafficking, of course. And it also provides a very strong support system. So today, this opportunity 
in sync with our mission to sustain a pub to start a public dialogue on not only the grave issue of trafficking but also the overarching social phenomena of gender based violence we are here to speak up with v so v i'm going to start asking you the questions now a large part of what you say and do and what we day is centered around speaking up and freeing oneself of emotional stigma and breaking free of trauma as a means to unite fight back and end violence can you speak more about how these actions which should be the core of all grassroots movements will help transform social and gender dynamics across the world yes um well good good morning and evening everyone and lena i'm so happy to be here with you and i just want to say a couple words about your extraordinary work it it just it has flourished over the last few years and it's so amazing to see the depth and the carefulness and the creativity with which you're doing this really powerful work to stop sex trafficking um i think what i'd like to begin by saying is that um you know the vagina monologues was this wild um this wild experience that came out of curiosity and it's taught me obviously so much over these last 23 years 24 years but one thing it really taught me is that when you break the silence you bust open isolation and loneliness and shame and self blame and you move into community and i think when i began to tell the stories of other women through art through fiction but 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 you know they were based on real women's stories other women really really identified with those stories so what would happen at the end of every show is they would literally line up because they needed to tell me their stories and i think when women hear their stories when women feel their stories um you know they can then feel the safety the freedom the lack of shame to realize they have a similar story and they can tell it and as the play kind of went around the world and was performed everywhere it became clear that violence against women was universal and we could build a global woman a, a global movement around breaking the silence and telling our stories because if i've learned anything the way the, uh, that that violence and power keeps women um um unable to move disempowered is by keeping them alone but when and 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 trauma feeds on that kind of loneliness but when you break that loneliness by telling your story you come into community which is the antidote to trauma right wow i mean so i can see that's the key which you've gone like break it open bring the stories out and uh, remove the loneliness and a sisterhood can uh, it's, it's like more voices amplifying one so that's been the core of your dialogue like it started with vagina and i can see that's happening with one billion rising Mm -hmm. uh, we did a 1 billion rising event in calcutta too like we had about 150 girls dancing with us along with us i like know <laughs> i totally uh, get that um so i mean i'm um, just going a little ahead in this conversation building up to the fact that like, okay you use that so we can see more and more women and non binary individuals are coming forward today to speak up and call out against patriarchy and gender based violence and misogyny A downside to this has been a blame game and a black backlash. The onus is on the survivor, it seems, uh, as opposed to the perpetrator, and they are always being told, "Why did you speak up so late? Why didn't you, why didn't you say anything earlier?" Allowing it to happen to them, you know. So, what would your message be to such people? And yeah. Well, first of all, I think. the way patriarchy and perpetrators have maintained power over survivors is by gaslighting them it's a very brilliant tactic where you blame the victim um and you make the victim feel like they've done something and it's their fault and i think that's just a tactic it's been used forever and i think one of the things that movements do and and solidarity does among women is that we know when women speak up when women tell their stories when women come out of course people are going to accuse women of not believing them of saying we're extreme that we're exaggerating that it never really happened and we have to just know simply that is what they're going to do until 
they start to own and take responsibility for their actions and to not take it personally, to not let it upset us, to not let it disturb us, to just know that when you break the silence, when you tell your story, the, the perpetrator and the people who hold power are not going to be happy. But what I've also learned is that if you keep going and if you don't back down and if you don't say you're sorry and, it, and if you just hold the truth you know in your body and in your being, eventually things begin to change and people will start to come around and people will start to support you. But you have to survive um, that moment of attack. Mm -hmm. where, and, and, and one of the problems is that when we are raped, when we are beaten, when we are hurt, um, so much of it impacts our self-esteem. So much of it makes us feel unworthy. So that when we speak out, we're susceptible to people making us feel bad about ourselves. That's why we need each other. Because when you have a posse, when you have a group, when you have a movement that you can bond with, they have your back. So when you speak out, they will stand behind you. Lovely. And I think what happens in India is that it's so driven in the consciousness of a girl to be good. Mm -hmm. That I think the battle, the first battle is within herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge battle, I think, for that to transcend that first step. And then, of course, it's the backlash, which you're saying, of the patriarchal system. So isn't it also time we, what do you think, in our language and the way we approach the problem of violence, shouldn't that change? Isn't violence against women actually a men's issue? Well, that's a very good question. I, first, I want to address the good thing, because I think... This idea that a good girl is a quiet girl, a good girl is a passive girl, a good girl doesn't make noise, doesn't disturb, doesn't make waves. Um, we have to really redefine our understanding of what it means to be good. And to me, being good means you tell the truth, you stand up for your sisters, you refuse to be violated, you demand that people honor you, you demand that people respect you. That is being good. So I just want to say that. Love you. I love that. Um, yeah. And then um, I think one of the biggest one of the biggest problems we have is that this idea that we're going to end violence against women and there's, there's, it's kind of this abstract thing, like what violence, who's committing this violence, who's doing this violence, right? Like we know all men are not perpetrators. We know there are many good men, but one out of three women on the planet will be beaten and raped in her lifetime, which is a billion women. So, so somebody is doing this, right? Somebody is doing this and there are, a lot of men who are part of hurting women. So I would love us to see like a movement where it's men standing up to end men's violence against women and and yeah. and, and and men joining us in this struggle and understanding that when women are free and safe and happy and satisfied, everybody is free and safe and happy and satisfied. Like there's no separation. And this is, you know, this movement became a movement that women took hold of, but that's because we were waiting for men to do it and they didn't. And we always step in where people aren't doing things. It's now time, all these years later, you know, 70 years later, we've been working in this movement for men to join us and make this their issue because it is their issue. Yes. I mean, um, I mean, that's what I'm struggling with. Like, when I first entered into space and um, I could hear so much about, okay, it's really sad, it's really bad. I mean, she's been abused, she's been violated. This shouldn't happen. And then uh, when I tried to break down this in a layman's language, because that's what I was setting out to do, right? Talk to the public. I literally said, there are three main issues here. One is that the public is totally far away. It's demand driven. The legal system is weak. So we kind of try to break down this language more and more. And I, what I really realize is the euphemisms, it's the, it's the phrases where the blame is shifts from the, from the victim to the perpetuator, to the actual, the victim to, from the perpetuator. Like uh, even the word like uh, prostitute itself, it's means like as if she's standing there because of her own sweet will. And, uh, and the meaning is totally lost on the larger pub public on what it actually means. Um, that's something which you should start in a deeper way because I feel language is going to play a very big role in the future, how we mm -hmm. phrase things and say things. Well, I have to, I have to say, you know, doing um, the book, The Apology, my last book, where I wrote my father's apology to me for sexually abusing and, and physically abusing me, what's been really interesting since the book got published is I've been getting a lot of letters from male perpetrators 
who raped women or beat women or hurt women who are actually writing amends letters and sharing them with me. And it's made me really hopeful that there may be an opening, um, a readiness in men to start taking responsibility for the, the, the really terrible things they've done and to really begin to shift who they are in this world and not continue to do those kind of things to women. And I yeah. think without reparations, without apologies, we really can't go forward because there are 1 billion, at least 1 billion women on this planet who have been traumatized, who've been violated, who've been invaded, who've been hurt, who've been undermined, who've been trafficked, who've been sold, who've been, name it. And that has to be dealt with before we can move forward with trust and with any kind of hope of, of building this solidarity between men and women. Beautiful, I think it's really well said. And I think that's the way ahead. I totally agree with you. Um, just going to the larger framework of how it's to, today with the world is where, where the world stands today. So talking about the US presidential elections, you know, sweeping the headlines and the amount of recognition women got in politics and uh, women of color, no less, less like your uh, Kamala Harris and uh, you have the others there, Cory Bush. In India, too, the 2019 Lok Sabha elections has seen actually 78 women legislatures uh, coming into representing the parliament. And we have women like uh, Remya Haridas, 32 years, an MP from Kerala, a Dalit woman, and Pramila Bisoi, 69-year-old MP from Orissa, who belongs to an economically lower class and who's now representing their constituencies in the parliament. So these are really big wins. Um, However, our reality is when it's, of course, it's such that when it comes to women in politics and their, and their actual involvement in the decision-making processes, men still do have a final say. So um, we, how do you think representation or participation in politics can pave the way for legislative amendments to address violence uh, against women? Because that's where it all starts. Well, I think... I always say, you know, it's important to have women in power, but it depends on which women, right? Yeah. I mean, we only have to look towards Maggie Thatcher to see what kind of women we don't want in power, right? Yeah. And I think, number one, I think it's just not representation. It has to be who has a vision, who's a feminist, who's mm -hmm. anti caste ism, anti-white supremacist, who cares about the climate, who is against this morbid inequality of wealth, who's fighting for worker rights, who's fighting for the earth, who's fighting for landowner, you know, for the poor to have land. I mean, there's so many issues. So I think, first of all, we've got to look at what women and what do they stand for. My sense, having worked with women now for many, many years, is the most powerful and trustworthy worthy women are women who we used to call vagina warriors in in, uh -huh. in in our movement, but women who have been through the worst pain, who have yeah. suffered some of the most difficult situations, and rather than seeking power or money or fame, they have devoted their lives to making sure what happened to them did, doesn't happen to other women. And Cori Bush, who you brought up, is a very good example of that. She's one of my favorite people right now in Congress. She's the first black woman who um, won, won from Congress in Missouri. She's a woman who has suffered domestic violence, knows what white supremacy is, was a leader in Ferguson of the Black Lives Matter movement, and mm -hmm. was a nurse. So she knows all about the issues that nurses and healthcare workers and working women face. And she is coming from that experience that she knows in her body and her being, so, and she is fighting for those same people who have gone through, who are suffering from what she has suffered from. Those are the women we need in power. And I think the more women we get like that in power, the more men will have, you know, it, it, they will begin to see that grassroots women, actually, mm -hmm. and particularly women of color, need mm -hmm. to be leading the way. Lovely. Um, I'm so happy that, and, and I hope we, we see more like them. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's a very vital point. It's not about representation, but it's about who's representing us. That's really mm -hmm. important. Yeah, we see we see a lot of that in India too, where we don't see much action coming from where we really uh, hope it would have come. Yeah. So coming to your work, you do you were mentioning uh, watching City of Joy has been simultaneously being very painful and a liberating experience to see women coming coming out of the unspeakable tragedies and finding themselves to see themselves rehumanized, if I may say so. 
It really resonates with the work we've been doing with Sundarbans and with the survivors of child marriages, domestic violence, rape, sex abuse, and trafficking. How do we ensure that we create awareness about violence against women and we do not end up appropriating the trauma of the women whose experiences, life experiences that we discuss? So since at the end of the day, there is a power imbalance where we have a platform and a story, and that's not always ours to tell, but it needs, still needs to be heard. And uh, what do you say about that? Well, I think I think the, the situation is wherever possible, I think we should be offering platforms for women to tell their own stories. I think one of the beautiful things about City of Joy was that women, that film, was that women did tell their own stories. And um, they had agency over the way they wanted those stories told and the way and what parts of those stories they wanted people in the world to know and how they wanted to tell them. And they even got to look at all versions of the film. They got to decide what they wanted in, what they wanted out, so they felt safe. They felt like they had agency. They felt that they were protected in telling those stories. I think sometimes at the beginning of our work in the Congo, for example, women asked me if I would tell their stories for them or, or just put their stories out in their words because they weren't ready. And then a few years later, they became ready. And now they tell their own stories. So I think wherever possible, we shouldn't be telling other women's stories. They should be telling their own stories and we should be providing platforms and situations where their stories can be heard. And, and where we amplify those stories, stand behind those stories and put wind at the back of those stories so the world hears them. Well said. I, I mean, that's a real, um, it brings more clarity to the space because like I was saying, we, we are still really um, uh, nascent in the space and we still kind of struggle with trying to, because we don't want to put them out as, um, they're not stories eventually, it's that person's life. So it's so important to be sensitive. So I like the fact that you say, let them say, let them say as much as they want to share and not share what they don't want to share till they are not comfortable until they actually realize that even sharing their stories will actually liberate them as well as help so many others, which is our intention, of course. Um, today, we see this really intersectional feminism becoming the main phase of the feminist movement. And there is an increasing critique of Western feminism. Yet plays like the vagina monologues continue to be relevant and being translated and adapted globally. While it's very difficult to point out a universal female experience, what do you think draws people to the play? Well, I want to say that I think the John Miles is a very intersectional play and always has been, right? Uh -huh. it's, it's, it deals with class, it deals with race, it deals, there were, there were 10 years ago, I wrote transgender monologues, so transgender women were a part of it. Um, I think it deals with a cross-section and intersectional issues. So that's number one. Um, number two, I feel like um, I wish, I wish that the play were outdated. You know, I dream of a time um, where we are liberated and mm -hmm. where there's no more violence in the world. Women aren't beaten or raped or denied opportunities in education, where mm -hmm. women aren't sex trafficked or forced into child marriages or forced to serve men and not have careers or denied abortions and agency over their own bodies or shame for having desire and sexuality. We can go through the list. Yeah. But even during COVID, we have seen this horrible rise in domestic violence because women are caught in their houses and aren't able to escape and the rise of childhood abuse in, in, in during COVID as well. So what I feel is um, the play tapped into um, a lot of those issues in women. It tapped into um, women longing for good orgasms and not being able to know how, not knowing how to get them. It tapped into women longing for a different kind of int intimacy with partners. It tapped into women longing to talk about um, um, homosexuality and lesbianism and love between women. It mm -hmm. tapped into all kinds of issues. And I think, you know, I keep thinking, oh, it's going to be irrelevant. But last year, there were 600 places that did the play. So we haven't sadly yet 
achieved um, women's liberation. We haven't achieved a, 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 a liberatory point where, where, where gender is something that we, we know is not fixed and it, it's evolving and it's, it's free and it's, it's continually expressing itself. And there are so many other issues we have to deal with, but also we haven't ended this methodology of violence, which actually is the thing that keeps women in their place. And yeah. I guess until we do, the play will remain popular and relevant. It's very relevant. And yeah, I mean, every time I think that we hear a new nuance to it, every time there is a new layer to it, which, uh, <laughs> because there's so many layers to this conversation, and at some point of time, you pick up something else, and at some point of time, it's another layer or another thought which uh, which, which you identify with. Um, I mean, uh, how else would you think? Like, I know uh, vagina monologue is a really pop popular form, but were you have you ever thought of doing another uh, version? I mean, not just a version, and another style or something more with theater, performance art, uh, a bigger movement beyond this, like. Anything well, else? I'm working right now. I'm working right now on um, taking the book of the apology and making it a play so that will be performed by two men at a time. So it will really be where you go to the theater and you can actually witness men apologizing and be a part of that act, which I think will probably be more radical than talking about vaginas, seeing that we hardly ever heal male perpetrators' apology ever, ever. And even if it's about the Me Too movement, we didn't hear it. So I think the act of a, of a male perpetrator making a public apology, it, 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 if I've learned anything, it's that the non-apology is one of the columns of patriarchy. It actually holds up the system. And when men start to apologize, the whole system starts crumbling down. So that's what we've really got to work on is, is, is to help male perpetrators have the space, have the safety, have a context, where they can begin to address the wrongs they have done and transform those into healing. Lovely, and it actually takes us back to the point where we say it's actually a men's issue. So it would actually be such a powerful platform to start that dialogue. And I could actually see it again being taken on across the world by whoever wants to play it. I mean, wow, I mean, I'm getting this imagination. <laughs> can you imagine that's gonna open up such a yes. huge dialogue? Yes. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. No, wow. it's so exciting it's to think about, it really is. Oh, to be seeing that. Um, coming to the present scenario today under COVID-19, the pandemic has hit our women the most, especially in India. The Indian female labor force participation is all is one of the lowest in the world. It already was underpaid and hidden, and now even more. And they are at risk of any permanent. Uh, they are actually at a risk of a permanent exit from the labor market, resulting in the feminization of poverty. More domestic violence complaints have arisen in the COVID-19 than in the last 10 years in India. India also stands on top of the list of reports against child sexual abuse material as been reported by the National Center of Missing Exploited uh, in the United States. And then there are women from marginalized communities, the religious minorities and uh, indigenous communities who have been overcoming systematic oppression throughout the COVID. We've heard so many stories coming in, beyond the fact that trafficking has increased. Do you think this pandemic is unraveling or undoing the decades of progress that we have made in our fight against inequality, poverty, and patriarchy, and abuse? We're seeing big changes happen across social structures, from work cultures to social structures. There has been a collective paradigm shift in the way we are perceiving and thinking about labor, poverty, and livelihood. On the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the outside front, I mean, not the women front. But can we use this time, and we are seeing this huge paradigm shift, this time of crisis and opportunity to turn the age-old norms of problems of patriarchy on its head? Like, can we just collectively make it seem as if it's no more just women? It's a huge humanity which is coming forth. But take it again, embrace the women issue in it. Is something more uh, a deeper uh, kind of churning possible here? Well, I think I think what COVID has done is revealed all the um, ongoing historical underpinnings of neoliberal capitalism, right? And white supremacy, casteism, hate, 
disrespect for workers, lack of basic services, water, food, healthcare, housing. You know, when we talk about pre-existing conditions, what we're talking about is systematic oppression, right? It's revealed climate catastrophe, which is already here in the global South with storms and floods, droughts and locusts, and in the West with fires and storms, right? I mean, I think if we wanna understand how we look at workers and essential workers and workers on the front line, we only have to look at the way we've treated our workers during COVID, right? Whether it was um, whether it was healthcare workers in this country who we didn't fight to get PPEs and protections for and make sure that they could do their job without dying, or whether it was all, it was all the workers in India who were um, forced to leave the cities without any protections and then found themselves on the roads, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we have to understand is that we have no, this. the world is not oriented towards people. It's oriented towards the very, very rich. We don't protect our workers. We don't honor our workers. We don't cherish our workers and we don't pay our workers. And we don't make sure our workers have work, right? So I think part of what has happened or a large part of what COVID has been is the reveal of what has been here historically. And I think what's been wonderful to see is these powerful movements rising up everywhere, right? Whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's fair wage groups, whether it's women fighting for land, whether it's, we can go down the list of, of incredible mass movements that are happening. We are seeing people understanding that we cannot put our faith in governments big institutions that we have to have faith in our mass movement. And I would just like to say, like, just looking at nurses, what, what I've been working on over this pandemic, because I think nurses are like, they are just the vanguard, right? They're the vanguard of, of working people because they are so devoted. They are so kind. They go way beyond the call of duty. And yet we haven't honored them in this country and anywhere really in the world. And particularly this country though. And we've really been fighting for nurses' rights and fighting to tell the stories of nurses and fighting to get them out of there with the hope that that will inspire people to realize that how we treat nurses reflects mm -hmm. how we treat workers and how we treat the people who are actually saving our lives. And um, I just want to say this year in, in One Billion Rising, I'm really thrilled that we are doing One Billion Gardens Rising because our hope is that all around the world, people will plant gardens for food security, to build collective gardening and collective growing for a future together, and that we will dance in our gardens and rise in our gardens and understand that we, as we, we've heard many times, we are the people we've been waiting for. We are the, those masses of people who will determine our fate. And we can't wait for governments who are corporate governments, um, you know, um, reliant on and, and beholden to corporations and big money. We have to be the people who take care of ourselves and take care of the people who are taking care of us. And I, I totally, I mean, I mean, I think it's a time to be really conscious human beings being responsible for every action, everything, every, uh, whatever we consume. I totally uh, believe. I mean, I'm finding what you just said very interesting. One billion gardens. What exactly? Well, gardens rising. Yes. And you know, all over India, they've already started to plan their gardens. So we can do it in the streets of, of Calcutta. They can be in the mountains of Himachal Pradesh. They can be, you know, everywhere. But the whole idea is like, how do we build gardens together? How do we plant gardens together? Because a garden reflects your belief in the future. A garden yeah. reflects diversity. A garden yeah. reflects, you know, um, the fact that things grow and change and need pruning and need attention and need watering and need care. And there's such beautiful metaphors for how we have to be treating each other right now. Right, lovely. Oh, I mean, it's actually giving a possibility of so many more dialogues and so many more possibilities mm. as a collective action beyond just, of course, the gender issue, um, the global issue, the climate issue, <laughs> the health issue. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, Eve, you know, uh, we, sorry, we, we just let out, uh, we asked a lot of people to ask us some questions which they would like to ask you. We have a few here. I'm going to start with one out here. Today, one of the most divisive issues in feminism is the sex work prostitution debate. 
it becomes important to bring it up in the context of gender-based violence. Is sex work slash prostitution, exploitation, or gender-based violence? Is the question of choice giving a false sense of agency? How can feminists come together on this issue? So complicated and so um, ripe for controversy. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, agree. I, I mean, what I feel is this. Um, I have met many women around the world who I've spent a lot of time talking to who did not feel like they had any choice going into sex work. Um, they were poor or they were sold or they were forced or um, they just simply didn't have a choice. And right. I've also met women who feel they did have a choice and who feel that is something they chose and it's something they like to do and it's something. And I think for me, I can only say, I, I've i always said each woman has the right to determine her own destiny. So I am fighting for the women who don't have choice, for the women who feel like their lives have been stolen from them, they've been trafficked, they've been undone, they've been in deep poverty, they had to give their bodies up and, and, and then they got forced into a world they had no control over. And I'm also saying that I'm not going to take away women's right if they feel like something is right for them and that, that's what the work they wanna do and they're conscious of it. I don't think it's, it's up to me to tell them that isn't true. True that, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with you. So when we were asked that, I said the simple dynamics of the fact that this so-called workspace has a 12% higher mortality rate. I mean, on what context can you call it a workspace? And mm -hmm. um, it's more abusive than any other space. Mm -hmm. This is a space where even the police won't really come and walk in to support you. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been cases and stories of um, brothel in Germany where the police doesn't come in, even if there is a report. So mm -hmm. it's like I'm like you're saying, we don't want to uh, we don't want to judge anybody, but it's a very difficult space for me to address as a workspace. I don't agree with it myself, but like you're saying, we would say it's a choice if you think you have one. And a lot of times I you have one, but I would say the majority of women that I've met in the world do not feel like it's a choice. Exactly. And I and I know there are some um, who do feel that. So um, I'm, I can't we can't legislate and talk people out of what their own experience is, you know? Totally. I, I agree with you. So this question came, I said, this is very interesting. I kind of get very passionate when I'm answering that. So I said, it's better to get your version too. Um, is it at all possible, theoretically speaking, at least, to have a truly equally heterosexual relationship? This is from Sri Lagna in Kolkata. Ha, huh, a truly equal heterosexual relationship. Wow. I I imagine it's possible. Um, you know, I think um, it really requires that both people be super enlightened. It requires that both people want to be free. It requires that whoever, um, if it's, you know, man, woman, right? I'm assuming we're talking about heterosexual, right? Or, or is that what there was, heterosexual? Heterosexual, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, um, it, it, it really requires that someone is committed to a process of liberation and a process where they want to hear where they're stymieing liberation, where they're not allowing it, where they're... Um, where they're, they've got resistance in themselves to see their partner be big, be fabulous, shine, be a big light, and where that's intimidating them. That they have to have an openness and a desire to grow and be liberated. Without that, no, I do not think it's possible. I mean, if, 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 if both people aren't committed to that as part of what they're doing together, I, I think it's very, very hard. It has I to be a quality part in every relationship. You know, yeah, I think yeah. equality is hard between all people because often relationships, there's one person who dominates and the other person who doesn't. Okay. And I think to to be to be in equality with each other in a friendship, in a love relationship, in a transgender relationship, in a gay relationship requires a lot of work where you where you each have your voice, where you each have your opinion, where you each have your life, where you each have your desires, where you each have your 
-hmm. you know, your, your, your fulfillment. And that, that requires people getting out of egoic states, not controlling, <laughs> releasing, supporting, and learning how to love. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's about the openness and actually rising above the ego. Or, anyway, yeah. it's a yeah, I totally get you. Uh, we have a question from Surubi in Bangalore. She's asking you, can you recommend five books, films, or five more, or any books, films, plays, music? Something which the youth definitely need to listen or read to have a better understanding of feminism, gender equality, which has motivated and inspired you to anything in literature or arts, which you think is a good share for them. Well, I think I think um, there are people one can read, whether it's Audre Lorde or Bell Hooks or um, I would say Simone de Beauvoir. Um, I'm trying to think of the people who really impacted me. Um, um, June Jordan, um, um, and 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 in terms of liberation, you know, like I I got my liberation from people like Tina Turner, like watching uh -huh. women who were really powerful rock stars who lived inside their bodies, who felt they had a right to their their expression and their power and their sexuality, and just they were just amazingly forceful, charismatic, um, alive women who didn't cut themselves off. And so I think that's really important. Like who, who, what is art that inspires you? Like Michaela Cole and her new series, um, I May Destroy You. That's an amazing point of, of, of departure to look at sexual abuse and a woman taking agency in her own hands um, and finding films and finding stories and finding plays where you see women as architects and agents of their own destinies, um, you know, and there's a lot of those kind of pieces out right now um, where you can, you can, you know, but I, I, I think finding poets and, and finding voices of women who are not, um, and you're asking for recommendations. So I get, I just gave a few, yeah. but there's more. <laughs> no, we've got a whole list. I think, uh, I think she's got her answer because I think it's important to uh, motivate and inspire people with the right uh and it's always good to share because it gets a deeper layer and understanding, you know, the thought process and stuff. But also I think there's other areas like Vandana Shiva, mm -hmm. looking at her writings and looking at what she's written about the earth and, and, and seeds and our understanding of collectivity and, and, and land ownership. And I mean, I think, you know, um, feminism for me is, is, is really about our relationship to life, right? And, mm -hmm. and 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 not being dominated and not being controlled and not having our wildness be, mm -hmm. be be pushed down in the same way that we love our earth and we want her wildness to always be cherished and to be to be in awe of it. And I think so what are the women in all different kinds of fields that mm -hmm. can provoke you to understand that you have a right to your dreams, you have a right to your ambition, you have a right to your vision, you have a right to fulfill whatever it is that you know that is your bliss that is driving you in this world i totally agree i i remember i got this moment of real amazing nirvan when i read mahashweta devi she read this, she wrote this really small book on um it was about the kala uh, it was post mahabharat and she spoke about the worker women who were going home because their men had died mm. And the way she spoke about them, their femininity, and the way they are talking and enjoying and combing their hair mm -hmm. and uh, drinking water. And I thought it was so beautiful. Like, I, I mean, for mm -hmm. me, uh, I, I mean, I can understand it. It's just sometimes it's the character itself which inspires you. Okay, I'm looking at the next question we have. We have out here is, I'm going to say some, some swear words. Please excuse me. We use swear words like motherfucker, pussy, cunt, every day without really realizing the far-reaching implications of it. A lot of my friends tell me I'm overdoing and overthinking it when I ask them not to use such words. Do you think language propagates sexism and even violence? I'd like my friends to hear it from someone like you. It's anonymous. It's a very good question. And I actually do think it influences us. Like I... Um... There's certain words like I just really try not to use unless I'm in a really bad mood. But um, I think, and I'm, I'm not even going to use them because I don't want to. But I think, I think um, if we use the words about women's organs in a derogatory way, 
we begin to see them in a derogatory way. If we call women bitch and we call women MFs, um, what is what are we saying? Like that th th we're perpetuating an idea about ourselves to me that um, is lowly, you can't be trusted, women are mean, women are always out for themselves. These are just tropes that are just completely untrue. And I think um, what we say matters, um, who we say it to matters and how we say it. And I'm, I'm not always good about this. Sometimes when I get mad, I have a terrible mouth, but I try never publicly to use those words. I, I did once recently, after Biden won, and I basically said to the predator in chief, you can now fuck off. And I, I do feel that because I feel like um, Donald Trump has been with me my entire life. I have been fighting him my entire life. I think he is monstrous. I think he's misogynist. I think he's a racist. I think he has bought, he's curated a world of hate, which now feels emboldened. It's not that he created it because this country has had 400 years of racism right. and, 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 and began with genocide against the indigenous people. So he didn't create this, but he has emboldened it, he's invited it and he's curated it. And it's time for him to go. And I think sometimes it's appropriate to say, fuck off. And sometimes it's appropriate to say, your time is over, leave, get out and go away, you know? Um, but um, I would say for the most part, I try really hard to find language that matches the way I want us all to be living in the world. Yes, I like I totally agree with this because I feel uh, language plays a very important role. That's what we've been struggling with ourselves. One question more before I actually ask you if you have anything to share with us. Uh, what's your take on the porn industry? Does pornography legitimize power relations and gender-based violence? Which is a huge question for me, but I'd like to hear it from you. Um, I think that pornography is just incredibly destructive. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that 80% of boys learn about sex for the first time from pornography is, is hideous. Mm -hmm. I don't think it reflects um, any kind of sexuality that is interesting to me. Do you know, um, for me, what is beautiful about sexuality is sensuality, is connection, is intimacy, is fun, is imagination, um, is, is individual ways we all learn how to touch each other and be with each other. And porn just feels so mechanized and brutal and forceful and all about domination and all about do it. And it's all about, it's all about uh, penetration rather than mm -hmm. all the other aspects of sexuality that are, I mean, even when it's about those other things, to me, it's rarely where you see women empowered in their own sexuality, empowered mm -hmm. in their own desire, um, feeling that they can have agency to lead and agency to 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 make things happen in their own way. Um, I mean, I'm all for eroticism. And if we had beautiful erotic visual videos where women were equally empowered and they were sexual and beautiful and people could come together in these, I'm all for that. It's uh -huh. the oppression of women. It's the violence of porn. It's the it's just the mechanized boringness of porn. It's just boring and bores into you. It bores into your soul. And it doesn't teach boys like mm -hmm. um, that being shy is actually adorable, that taking your time is delicious, that mm -hmm. not knowing what you're doing and stumbling is part of the experience. And it makes you vulnerable. And vulnerability is such a part of sexuality. So there's so many necessary steps that get skipped over. Yeah. That's very well said. Again, I think I'm saying that every of your answers, Z. You're so amazingly uh, articulate. So we have one or two more questions before I would. I, I, I really want to ask you: Do you have anything particular to share? Do you have an Indian audience here? Anything which you would like to share, or you think we should take one or one more question? Let's take the questions. Okay. <laughs> so we do have here Surbi saying: How does one say that they were abused by a family member? The repercussions. I think you did mention this, but she wants you to address this. The repercussions are huge and one can become a family. Uh, it, be it becomes a family outcome of sorts in a family based society. How does one find this trend? It's a very, very good question. And it's very hard. It's mm -hmm. very hard. 
you know, somebody once said to me, you have to decide whether you want to choose dignity or family, you know, and um, that was a very apt choice. For me, telling the truth meant my mental, physical, and emotional survival. And if I didn't tell the truth, I wouldn't have survived. But it also did mean losing my family. You know, I don't have any contact with my family anymore because um, they didn't really like that I was public about what I had done for the most part. And um, that's their right. And I honor them and I respect them. But I had to speak up for me because I needed to save my own. Um, I need to speak my truth to power. I needed to say this happened and it was real. And um, and I know by doing that, I also helped a lot of other women do the same, or I believe I did, or I hope I did. Um, you can't really make it okay for your family. You can't, um, your truth telling um, may make some happy. You may discover in telling the truth that other women in your family or other boys in your family come forward and have had the same experience. Um, you may discover that people outcast you and then you're gonna have to find other survivors and build your chosen family. I have an amazing family that I live with today of chosen people who have all broken silences in various ways, whether it's from being gay, whether it's from survivors, whether it's from standing up against um, white supremacy. I have a lot of amazing people in my life today who I feel as close to as any blood family. And I feel have my back and I love so profoundly. And I had to make that choice where I was willing to sacrifice um, the connection to my family for me being free because my liberation was the most important thing to me. But everybody's got to make their own decision about that and know that if you do stand up for yourself, there, you know, there is an immediate price to pay, which is you may lose your family, but down the road, the gains for me have been so much greater um, in terms of I'm myself today and I have no secrets and I don't have to walk around and pretend that what happened to me didn't happen to me. And that is a huge weight off my back. Yeah, totally feel you. And I think that it's that moment where you know it, when you can't take it anymore, which will actually make you just sort of burst mm -hmm. out or just give you the strength to do what you have to do. Till you're not, till you're thinking about it, probably it's still <laughs> mulling. Yeah. And it's going to be that, that moment where you know there's no way out. Totally, totally. Okay. Yeah, totally. So we have another question here from Sri Lagna. Do you think the title Vagina Monologues leans towards biological essentialism? How do you include trans women in your conversation? Well, I want to really begin by saying I never said that um, in the vagina monologues or anywhere that being a woman means you have a vagina. Never said that. I never mm -hmm. said those two things were the same. I said I was exploring women who had vaginas. So that's number one. Um, number two, I wrote uh, a transgender monologue years ago um, based on interviews I did with many transgender women, transgender women, and they that piece has been in the play and many transgender women have been part of the play and performing the play for a long time. Um, but the truth of the matter is that um, I believe we should investigate the lives of transgender people and I believe we should investigate the life of gay people and non-binary people and gender evolving people and everybody's life matters. It's not either or. And at the same time, there are 1 billion women on the planet who do have vaginas and there are seriously bad things that happen to vaginas. They get raped, they get, um, they get cut, they get attacked. They get ravaged, they get diseases that no one cares about. Um, and to me, this is a serious point of interest and concern. But I think sometimes we get into either or. Um, I stand with all my heart for the rights of, of transgender people. I stand, and non-binary people, I respect their, um, their, their, um, their willingness and their bravery to be who they are in such a transphobic and homophobic a world. And, um, and at the same time, I stand with women who have vaginas and both those things are true. And I, 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 I really feel um, that um, I, I, I hope there will be more and more plays where trans women, trans men tell their story and where non-binary people tell their stories and I will celebrate those places as I have, I've actually produced two. So I, 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 I hope we can all support each other and be in solidarity with each other in telling our stories. 
I think you're 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 emphasizing more and more. This is all about inclusivity. All your discussion, it's it's not leaving anybody out. And I think uh, it's good to articulate that again and again. Um, you're actually nearly an hour into it. I was just wondering, do you have anything to share? You are you still have an audience of youth here. Anything which you would like to leave them behind with? Because I really think we truly need voices like yours to really uh, shape the next generation. Well, I'm so impressed with this next generation of youth and and their organizing, their vision, their brilliance, their their ability to see and be in just ways we weren't able to be when we were young. Um, I, I, I learned so much from, from younger people and I need them in my life, constantly teaching me the ways and, 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 and their vision of things. And I, I look at all the movements that are now growing up whether there are movements um, to for the planet and for the earth for to stop climate catastrophe, how youth and particularly girls are leading these movements, I see youth who are front and center in in the anti caste movement, in the anti you know racism movements. I see youth who are there in the Me Too movement, you know, driving those forward. And um, we need you. We need you to take take the baton now and lead the way. And I am there behind you, beside you, with you, for you. Um, and I want to learn from you. I want to grow. I want to, I want to be challenged. I want, you know, I want to see the next brilliant visionary ideas that are emerging so I can be, so I can keep emerging. Great, Eve. It was, v, it was really lovely talking to you. Sorry, it just sort of slips right. out of my brain. Okay. Um, no, I think uh, this has been a great conversation, and I think it's just the tip of the iceberg because there is so much more to discuss. I really do hope that this community really takes up this dialogue in a much more focused manner and in a much more uh, a manner with, with consciousness, you know, and with kind of learning and a more in depth study of the space and not jumping into a thought without doing a research. I think it should be something which is well read, well researched and well thought out so that they know where their voices are leading and how responsible their voices can be. And I'm so happy that we got this opportunity to kick off Me our 60 too. Day Me too. And I just want to say to everybody, support this wonderful work of Lena's. It's so important. And build your plant your garden and be part of One Billion Rising Gardens Rising. Um, you know, India is such a huge, huge part of One Billion Rising. And we have such magical movements and risings all over the country. And I, I, I miss India. I'm sending you all my love. Um, everybody really stay safe, protect yourself, wear masks, and we'll get through this pandemic and then we'll be back where we can hug each other and touch each other and love each other in community again. And we do another very big one billion rising movement. Yeah. This, I don't think it's going to happen next fair, probably the next after. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it was lovely having you here, V, and we hope to see you again and more conversations and more collaborations. Me too. Me too. Thank you so much.